because of our reforms, we didn't just balance the budget. We now say in our schools, there's no more seniority or tenure. You can hire and fire whoever you want. You can pay based on performance. And there you just heard Governor Scott Walker at the Iowa Freedom Summit this past January. The Republican candidate is setting up to run for president as the man who tamed Wisconsin's unions, says an article from Politico. But they also say Scott Walker's largest target is college professors setting tenure policies rather than tenure protections. And that's a great place to bring in our roundtable. Please welcome in Gabby Morangiello, reporter at CampusReform.org, and also joining us today is former general counsel to the Democratic Party of Virginia and attorney Stephen Cobb. Thanks so much for being with us here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. All right, so Gabby, let's talk to you, you because I think out of everybody here in this panel, you're probably the closest <laughs> to uh, uh, being in a college That's classroom. Safe. Um, we, we look at this long time tradition of tenure in, on college campuses. Do you feel like it's time to go? Absolutely. I wish that other governors were proposing similar reforms to Scott Walker's uh, because what tenure ultimately does is it eliminates any responsibility for a professor to be an unbiased and effective educator. And ultimately, we've seen what the consequences of that are at the Leadership Institute's campus reform. We've seen professors rail against Christians and white men in their classroom and on social media and not face any consequences because tenure protects them from being fired. So in order to curb that abuse and that cycle of indoctrination on college campuses, we need to look at reforming the system currently in place. All right, Stephen, what do you say to that? Well, I think uh, one of the things that Gabby hits on correctly is that the, the real point of Governor Walker's agenda here is to make it easier to f fire college professors. It's not something that I agree with. I think that sort of academic independence is paramount. And the way uh, in which he's proposing this would then turn the, uh, the standards for that tenure over to the political appointees in the Board of Regents, which not only ma would make it assumably easier to fire these uh, uh, tenured professors, but would then also create a system whereby every four years when you're electing new governor and appointing new members to the Board of Regents, you would have a uh, circling in and out of political appointees who can change those uh, criteria every four, eight years. It, it provides no consistency and is an all around a bad policy. What do you mean? Well, look at I mean, take, for example, Governor Walker. He goes under review every two years. He just went under review by Wisconsin voters in 2014. So he's kind of practicing what he preaches. And I do think the professor should be held accountable. And you say that this is perhaps an attack on academic freedom. Well, all that I've seen tenure do is enable professors to get away with launching attacks on students and their opinions. And one thing, the guys, that comes up often when Scott Walker takes on either education unions or college professors in this case, Democrats love to bring up the fact that uh, Governor Scott Walker uh, will be facing the fact that he didn't graduate from college in the 2016 elections. Let's hear Howard Dean. Scott Walker, were he to become president, would be the first president in many generations who did not have a college degree. He's never finished. Right. So the issue here is not just an issue of dancing around the question of evolution for political reasons. The issue right. is how well educated is this guy? Well, first of all, does that really even matter nowadays? We, do you think we put too much emphasis on college educations? Yeah, absolutely not. It doesn't matter. And I mean, take, for example, Steve Jobs. He never graduated college. And look at the empire that he built with Apple. Uh, Governor Scott Walker actually has a son in the University of Wisconsin system. So he has a vested interest in making sure that his reforms succeed and do what, he, th what they're intended to do. I don't think a college degree is necessary to evaluate his effectiveness. But let me ask you this, Stephen. Do, is he qualified then to even talk about college education, though? Maybe one could argue that. Well, you'd hope that no matter uh, what the educational or business or leadership background of a governor, that they're going to you know, approach that office uh, holistically and for everything that, that it touches upon. But, you know, I, I think it is, to a certain extent, fair game to say that he has himself shown a bit of a lack of interest in, in higher education personally, and perhaps that's indicative in his policies now. Let me ask you this, Gabby. You were saying it doesn't really matter, but some people might say in this society that we should strive for people to want a higher education because it, a society that has, that's better educated is a better society. Would you disagree with that argument? I'm not saying college is for everyone. But isn't sure. that something we should strive for? 
Well, we should. It, education is important, and it's important to have an educated citizenry. And I mean, Scott Walker, he did go to college. He just didn't complete it. So there was that uh, hope to obtain a college degree at some point. It just didn't work out for him. And I think that based on his current job and position in politics, he's been very successful without a college degree, which should serve as an example to others who may not, that may not be the best route for people to take. All right, we're running out of time. But it should also Steve. be noted that uh, you know one of the issues is that you know he, in, in many ways, uh, is the exception, uh, not the rule. I, I well, that's true. That I know there are uh, lots of whether that's of formal in high school, college, postgraduate degrees. Education is something that we hope people take as well, a. There is lots of data out there, Stephen. We got to go to a commercial break, showing that you will make more money if you go to college. But it is right. a debate worth having, and one that might come up on the 2016 trail. Coming back, Gabby Morangiello, Stephen Cobb. We're going to talk about. Rand Paul's flat tax plan right after this. Please welcome back to the roundtable Gabby Morangiello, reporter at campusreform.org and former general counsel to the Democratic Party of Virginia, Stephen Cobb. Thanks so much for sticking around with us. In a Wall Street Journal op-ed yesterday, Senator Rand Paul said he wanted to, quote, blow up the tax code and start over with a 14.5 percent flat tax on businesses and individuals. Of course, this has been tried before, but Stephen, I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, um, you're probably not a fan of the flat tax here, but has the time come to at least consider some big changes to our tax code? Well, sure. I, I think the uh, reform of the tax code is going to be and should be a very worthy discussion to have in both the Democratic and Republican primaries and the general. But make no mistake, you know, the all the follow-up articles on Rand Paul's proposals uh, had the you know the, the subheadline 1.2 trillion dollar budget deficit over the first 10 years if that was to be imposed. So, from any sort of, of fiscal outlook, when you look at a 1.2 trillion dollar shortfall over a 10 year period, it's really unfeasible. And he doesn't talk about how he would try and uh, curb or cut back government spending in order to deal with that that shortfall. So, but, but he has he has talked a lot about his penny plan in the past, cutting one percent from every single government agency. He has talked about uh, these these things before. Sure, I mean, at, at a 30,000 foot level, but if you're going to put out a new tax plan, uh, there better be the fine print there as to exactly how the it's going to be really uh, revenue neutral, such that you're not going to cut 1.2 trillion from the uh, revenues of the federal government over a 10 year period without specifically itemizing how you're going to uh, deal with cuts on the, the spending side. Talking about them in the, in the abstract is really not going to be helpful. Gabby, where do you stand on the issue of flat tax? Well, I think that Senator Paul's proposal is, is exactly as it's uh, advertised. It's fair and it imposes, it, it taxes all incomes at the same rate, in this case at 14.5 percent. And what that does is it broadens our tax pay, our tax base, it introduces additional revenue to the government and uh, is something that Democrats have been especially critical of. It eliminates the special interest loopholes that currently exist. So I support this and I think that what this will do is it'll force government to operate within a certain budget, much like what Americans, including young people like myself, are first to do every day. But what about, you know, this has been... Well, well I mean, let, let's, be, let's be clear here. One, it doesn't create additional revenue to the government. As, as I pointed out and as everyone to cover this has, it creates a $1.2 trillion shortfall over 10 years. So to say that it increases revenues to the government is, is inaccurate. Two, even under... Well, there may be a long-term uh, solution. A minimum wage also um, creates a shortfall initially, but in the long term, it has... I mean, there are certain... You can cite certain statistics, but I, I don't think that that's... I think there have been studies to disprove that. Steve, I'm sorry, Steve. Go ahead. Continue. Well, what you're not as it pertains to Senator, Senator Paul's plan. But. Well, let me let me ask you both, and let, let's start with you, Gabby. Uh, what about the idea of a consumption tax? That's been thrown around a couple times. Uh, look, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in tax policy, but uh, that is that has been thrown around, and I'd be curious to see what candidates, uh, as we approach 2016, have to say about that, both on the Democrat and Republican side. Stephen. One of the issues with a, a flat tax and a consumption tax is that they disproportionately uh, affect, uh, for lack of a better term, the working poor and those making uh, lower wages. So w when most people talk about a consumption tax, uh, not only does it hurt those who are making less more because they, they get taxed more on the, thing, the basic things that they need to survive, but even under ways when you're trying to limit that, it actually creates a larger bureaucracy by having to create a system whereby then they're giving rebates back. Uh, so, 
while I applaud and like the dialogue that is sure to come from these issues in both the Democrat, Democratic primary, the Republican primary, uh, and, and the general, uh, for these, for either any sort of flat tax, whether there, there be certain levels of it or a consumption tax, uh, these need to be brought out of the abstract and into the specific because they are far too flawed in the general sense. Well, I like to tip my hat to anybody who can propose a plan to talk about tax <laughs> reform, at least get the conversation out there right. because gosh knows we need, it needs to happen uh, considering the way things are going. Steve Forbes tried this back in 1996 when he was running for president, but still we do have a progressive income tax system in this country and it's probably not going to change based on some of the lacking specifics here in this Rand Paul. Yeah, but when you think about all the problems that the IRS has been having, well, there's some I that mean, say, in addition to a, blowing up the tax code, we should get rid of the IRS as well. Well, they're definitely, I, I agree with what everyone's saying. I think we need well, to Well, you can't get rid of the department that's in charge of bringing in the revenue to the, to the federal government. Well, yeah, something but that, would definitely but that have to department replace it. has been definitely having some issues. What, what was the wait time for people to get a hold of it, and then people were getting the wrong returns? It definitely needs to be revamped. We can certainly agree on that. I uh, couldn't agree with you more, but, you know, it, it's concerning then that, I believe it was a hundred million cut from their budget, which affects their ability to go into uh, effectuating these changes to their automated systems and increasing those efficiencies in government that we all want so badly. Very, very complicated issue, but tax policy is something we got to discuss. Gabby Rangiello, thanks for being with us. Also, Stephen Cobb, pleasure to speak with you as well. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, so we got a little bit in the weeds on tax policies there, but why yeah. not, right? Well, Important I mean, stuff. we've been covering a lot of issues. File that under boring but important issues. There, right? there we go. Okay, check. We're coming right back with more here on Newsmax <laughs> We're Now. We're going to liven Please it up. <laughs> stick around. <laughs>